As clerk of the Hadley Council on Aging, I call this meeting to order. You should be as the select board, Jane. I'm sorry. Thank you. As clerk of the select board. Too many offices. Thank you, Randy. Certainly. Um, as clerk of the select board, I call this meeting to order. And I would like to introduce our new uh, members. Molly Keegan, would you please wave? And Randy Iser. And a thanks to David Phil and John Roskevitz for all they have done for the town and the years that they have served on the select board. Thank you. All right. So the first order of business is the reorganization of the select board. So we need a chair and a clerk. So I'll make a motion. Uh, if my tallies are correct, I believe that normal rotation would go to Jane at this point. Um, so I'll make a motion uh, for Jane Nevin Smith to be the board chair for a second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, Jennifer. Roll call Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And now I need a clerk, please. <clears throat> Don't everybody I'll jump at once. Yeah. I'll move for Joyce. I would like to nominate Joyce. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second for Joyce to be clerk. Oh, great. Jennifer? I'm off. Okay. Roll we'll call the uh, Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalu? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Oh, funky. I love not being the last person to vote anymore. <laughs> that was the funnest time. So, um, as was stated earlier in an earlier meeting, we're going to now determine the starting time and date of in-person for the select board and hybrid meetings combined, and then set the remaining schedule. Is there... Can I have discussion from the board, please? Thoughts on this process? Question number one, what does in-person and hybrid, what does that look like? I believe the state requirement is that four of the five of us need to be present in person for a meeting to happen. So that is at a site, which in this case will be the, the Council on Aging. That's gonna be our new home for um, meetings. So four- Thank you. Jane, can I just clarify? Sure, go ahead. Um, right now, you are still able to meet. The whole board does not have to be, uh, the, you don't have to have the majority of the board in person. So we're still under until July 15th. That may change at that point, but you can um, have a mixture of meeting remotely of your board. So I just have a question about that. If for instance, we have a board meeting and two people are in person and three people are on the computer, that's still okay? Yeah, as long as I, I, Hadley Media can handle that. All right, I've seen them do that, so let's assume that works. All right. Yeah, and can Hadley Media do that? John? John might have stepped away, but I'll answer that yes, Hadley Media and I can handle that. Great, thank you. And when do we want to start having in-person meetings? September. But is there, did you say July 15th, Carolyn? I said I said September. I think there's, I'm asking if the state has allowed that to continue. 
You can do hybrid at any point. Um, and until we hear <laughs> otherwise, you can, the, you, the mixture of the board does not have to, everyone does not have to be in person. Before COVID, only one person could be remote. Okay. Mm-hmm. Can I my ask? Thoughts, um, my thoughts are is that there's still COVID very well present. My daughter tested positive today. So anybody that used her pen after her yesterday could very well. She was unaware. She's been fully vaxxed. And uh, I'm sure she doesn't mind me sharing because she actually said to me, what about the person that used the pen after me yesterday? She, she swabbed, when she, she washed her hands when she came in and she washed her hands when she went out. But that doesn't necessarily mean the same person after her did the same thing. I'm, t- I'm testing negative. I'm not sure where we're picking it up. I have um, several people, 30% of my providers are out of the office right now. Um, so it is very well out there still. People are going to the hospital and not being um, COVID uh, admitted, but as they are being admitted for other uh, illnesses, they are testing positive for COVID. So my thoughts are is that we still need to be very cautious and careful. Molly? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say I would love to go hybrid as soon as it is reasonably safe to do so. Um, I think, you know, I think everybody's all zoomed out at this point. I think that the um, hybrid meetings that I've either participated in or have watched um, are, seem to be working really well. So I really appreciate the fact that Hadley Media and Jennifer have worked on that technology to make it happen because there, there is something to be said for people being, being in a room together. I think it's just a different um, dynamic that happens there. But you know, certainly I would defer to um, you know, the, the numbers, um, you know, Board of Health and the opinion of others as to what is safe at this point. You know, I agree with Joyce, everything I know right now is that the numbers indeed are, are climbing quite dramatically. And, um, you know, we have Susan, we have Susan Mosler that just popped up. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm just going to say, I don't know if we want to make the decision to defer to September right now. Um, I think maybe this is an ongoing discussion we have as things evolve. Susan, do you want to add any comments as board of health? Uh, I can share some information with you. I just got the, you know, I get the reporting data from the state on the cases. You have to understand it's estimated now that only 7% of actual infections are being reported on the state database because of home testing. So that being said, Hadley, this has been the last two weeks, Hadley had 48, uh, which is up. Amherst had 701, which is way up, and Northampton had 325 positive cases, which is uh, way up as well. I think, you know, at, at this point, public health is not really looking at the number of infections. The metric is, is our hospital capacity. And, uh, you know, right now, our hospital capacity is not being uh, stretched. So, uh, you know, the general feeling seems to be that, you know, most of us are going to have a COVID infection. And uh, if we're vaccinated and uh, medications are available, if you're over 65 or in a high risk group, you know, so be it. So I, it's, I think it's, it's a very personal decision, you know, the risk benefit for, for every individual. And that's why it would be possible to have some people in person and others who are nervous about being the, there remote. The, yeah, the Board of Health has been doing the hybrid meetings. They're terrific. We have not had any problems. Okay. Um, Amy, do you have a, something you want to put in on this? Not really. It's, uh, I'm not muted. I just, oh. it doesn't matter to me whether we meet in person or not. Okay, Randy, do you have an input? So I was just going to ask if we can we do this on a you know a month by month basis. We don't have to, as Molly said, we don't necessarily need to decide right now that September is appropriate. But I agree with Susan and Joyce 
that there are still COVID issues out there and they're probably going to be for quite some time. So if we can just do it on a rolling basis, so to speak, so that we don't have to put ourselves in a box right now. Well, what if we made it an agenda item for the first meeting of every month? And then we would say this month we're ready to go or this month we're going to still stay remote. That, that sounds reasonable? fine to me. That, all right. Do we need a motion and a vote on that? Well, I'll make a motion to have uh, an agenda item on whether we have uh, uh, in-person or hybrid meetings versus total Zoom meetings at, at <coughs> the every monthly meeting, the first meeting of the month. Okay. Second that. Molly seconds. All right. Roll call, please, Jennifer. Row call Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Iser. Yes. And Keegan. Yes. Thank you. All right. And there is a list in the agenda of um, the. Uh, oh, oh wait, I, I'd like to go back. I'd like to talk about the starting time of the meeting. My. Personal preference would be 6.30 instead of 6 o'clock, but I don't know about the rest of you. How do you feel? Joyce? I like 6. We have so much on our agenda sometimes that instead of going until 10 o'clock or whatever, sometimes it'll hit you for 9.30 or 9 o'clock, so that's late enough for me. Yeah, I have to get up at 4.30 in the morning for work now since I work in Connecticut, so earlier the better. Molly? Um, I, I'm fine with either, you know, I think, um, in the past, the concern about starting earlier has been, uh, you know, if we're looking to maximize public input, wanting to make sure that people have the opportunity to be home, um, six o'clock's right at the dinner hour. Um, but that said, I also have watched many meetings that have extended for a long period of time. So I have to say, I prefer the earlier start than the seven o'clock start that we used to do. Randy? I have no preference, doesn't matter really to me. So while we're still meeting by Zoom, why talk and then um, revisit it once we decide we're going to do something different? Does that work for everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Since we're leaving it the same, I assume we don't need a motion for that. Okay. Um, there is a list in the agenda of first and third Wednesdays up through December 21st. Um, are there any of those dates that people have trouble attending? Uh, yeah, the week of uh, July 20th, I'm on vacation the 17th through the 24th, but if I, if I had to, and we were hybrid, I suppose I could log in. Well, and if we're going to always have a hybrid component to it, mm -hmm. then that may be a possibility. I'll probably be up at the beach most of the time, so I'll be Zooming from Salisbury. I don't have anything that I'm aware of right now, but if something comes up, then I agree with Molly and Joyce that I always have a computer with me so I can get into a meeting without any problem. Um, I will be traveling on a couple of those days, but assuming that where I am has... Um, internet, I will be able to join. All right, so as a tentative schedule, we will leave this first and the third Wednesdays of every month through December 21st. Mm -hmm. Do you want to vote on that? Jane, yes. Did you, did you happen to notice that Carolyn and I added that extra meeting on June 22nd? June 22nd. What reason? Procurement. We need you to vote on a ton of procurement. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be long. It's just we do need a third meeting that month. All right. Yep, it's fine. Okay. We may ultimately need third meetings anyway, but let's get started and see how we do with two. Uh, two will be my limit. Yeah, well, okay. 
I, I hear you, and I think that's true for everyone. And the question is two that are longer or three that are shorter, so. Well, it's either that or we have all of our other committees that we go to. So we have many other things that we are committed to uh, besides just the select board meetings themselves. So it's um, juggling our schedule and being available for our other committees is um, sometimes a little difficult. I agree. All right, is there any other business about reorganizing? Anybody have anything else they want to say? Okay, moving on to the <coughs> agenda, 3.1. Warrant articles, AP 2241, AP 2242S, AP 2242, PR 2222, AP 2243, AP 2244B, AP 2244S, AP 2244. Uh, the minutes of the June 2nd, 2001, the June 23rd, 2001, and the July 21st, 2001 uh, meetings are attached. You assume you have seen them. A one day liquor license for B1 vodka, changing the date from June 4th to May 28th, and an additional date of June 11th. The use of the town common, the Rex McCabe family bridal shower, July 30th, 2022 on the South Commons. A one day liquor license for Homewood Suites in the Amherst Cha Area Chamber of Commerce, June 1st, 2022. A one day liquor license for Leadfoot Brewing, LLC, May 29th, May 30th, and June 19th at Maple Valley Creamery at 102 Mill Valley Road. Are there any questions? Any comments? Randy, you're muted. You, when you said the minutes, Jane, you said 2001, not 2021. 2021, thank you. And then and since I was not here for any of that stuff, is it appropriate for me to vote on it? Probably not, but I don't so know. You, you can, because you're not, you, you are able to vote if you're not there, but you don't have to. If you're more comfortable abstaining, you can abstain, but board members who aren't at that meeting can approve them. Okay. Any other discussion? Jennifer? Roll call vote, please. You're muted. I need a motion and a second. I'm sorry, a motion for the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. Thank you. Motion by Molly, second by Amy. Roll call vote, please. Roll call Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, it's time for public comment. Uh, public comment period is limited to three minutes per person. If you're interested in speaking, please wave your digital hand or somehow let us know that you're interested in saying something. Does anyone see any hands waving around? All right, seeing none, we will continue. So I just wanna point out that we try to have a time schedule here, but sometimes if things move quicker than we want, we're not gonna just sit around and wait for the time to pass. We will keep moving forward in the meeting. If someone has a time <coughs> schedule and they're not present, then we will see the people who are speaking to order there. So the Mosquito Opt-Out Committee up the Mosquito Opt-Out Committee was approved, I've, I'm speaking for them as their liaison, um, by the town, fall town meeting to um, have a document that requires the town to be um, not, I'll let Bobby talk, she can do better. 
Bobby, you're here. Thought I saw her. Bobby came in. Yes, I see her. Okay. You're up, Bobby. She's come in and out two times. I think she might be having some um, problems with her microphones. We might need to give her just a moment. Okay, thank you. There you are. Okay, finally, success. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity um, to be here tonight. I'll make it very brief. I do want to thank Jane for all her good guidance uh, and, and sticking with us on this. She did pitch in and also the committee members, um, Tony Lynn Morelli, Shel Horowitz, Michelle, uh, Michelle Morris Friedman. Uh, we all did um, our part in this and putting it together. And I also want to thank Jennifer and Jessica for guiding me through the uh, minds of uh, field minds of um, town meetings. So uh, thank you very much. So um, just a brief overview. Uh, Jane did say that we were appointed uh, by the select board last fall as a result of the uh, vote by the town to opt out. We have been meeting regularly, collecting data, working with the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, following what's happened, surveillance. Uh, Hadley is a very low risk area for um, mosquitoes, West Nile and EEE. Um, the P Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District does do regular testing around town. There was a, uh, one incidence of West Nile, which is not uncommon, um, mosquito sample uh, and venture way uh, last August, but Board of Health was well informed of that as, and it wasn't a real risk to the town. Um, what you have before you, and you should have received your documents, is, a, is the application that we would like to be submitting to the, um, it goes to the state uh, executive office of <coughs> environmental affairs. Um, their approval is very much based on what the risk level is for the town of Hadley, meaning we are low risk means that we do have a good chance of uh, being approved for opt out. And this would be for the calendar year of 2022. Uh, we have what we really had to put together was an outreach and education plan, which is what you have probably in front of you um, or have all seen. Hopefully you have seen that. And it does outline a number of things that we either have already done or, or plan to do in terms of educating the public as to what the uh, risk of uh, how to prevent mosquito bites. We're, we're dealing with this as a very, um, as a public health issue. Mosquitoes are a nuisance, but there's certainly many things people can do, take personal responsibility to prevent mosquito bites. We had a very successful um, last Saturday tire recycling event with Firestone. Tires um, collect a lot of water, and standing water is one of the biggest uh, problems in terms of breeding mosquitoes. So we're both hoping people prevent bites as well as mitigate the um, the the uh, standing water in their in the communities to slow down the breeding of mosquitoes. Um, 65 tires were, were brought to Firestone last Saturday, which was really incredible. Good start for the town. A lot of residents brought their tires. Uh, we've been using a lot of Department of Public Health uh, publications, uh, working with the Board of Health, uh, who are supporting us in this effort. And uh, we feel like we have some real opportunities here. Jane has worked with the schools. There's a number of posters in school buildings. There are posters out there in, in some of the, like Vestra um, senior living uh, facilities as such. So we hope to continue this work in terms of outreach and prevention and education. Our application will reflect such. And we, uh, the, dead, the deadline for submission is May 27th. So we will get this to them uh, ASAP uh, and just want to share this information with you all and uh, just wondered what kind of questions you might have on the, on the effort. Anyone have any questions for Bobby? Uh, yeah, I've just got one question. So I just want to um, better understand you submit the application. Um, then they've got some amount of time to approve it or I'm not sure why they would deny it, but what, what exactly happens after you get the approval then? 
Very good question. Um, we, we will get notification uh, that they have a, hopefully have approved it. Um, and I don't know what the timeline is. They were they they were very they weren't really good on timelines this year. Uh, we didn't even get the 2022 application uh, until April. It wasn't put forth. We waited the whole year for it. So I don't have the exact time, but what, basically once they approve it, but what it means is that the town opts out of any aerial uh, spraying that they, there's, a, there's a group called the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board, um, SCRMB. Uh, to MCB, I, I can get you the information, but basically they, they're the ones that are, and they generally would only do aerial spray, spraying if there, there were a public health emergency with uh, EEE, uh, Eastern Equine Encephalitis, but we were opting out of having aerial spraying and leaving it up to people to take per personal responsibility, prevention of mosquito bites, make sure the kids you know, are protected, uh, how to use uh, repellents, um, carefully and, and, and um, healthfully um, and, and such. So answer your question directly, Molly, I don't have a timeline of when it'll be approved. They don't tell us that when we put the application, hopefully within the month. Any other questions? Thank you, Bobby and the committee. You've done a great job on this. And I Thank assume you, you'll be doing it again for the following years. I hope so. <laughs> You can have a little respite in the interim. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Um, new business. Uh, the ban. Linda, are you in? Um, okay. Yes, I wanted to update you um, on where we stand with our bans. If you recall, while we were in the construction process, we had many, many bans going at the same time. As of the end of 21, we did just a single bar. Oh, we actually, we just did two borrowings in 21 that uh, were due in 22. Uh, one of them uh, was a, uh, we paid off the full $100,000 of a remaining ban to Adams Community uh, Bank in the fall. And we're paying the second ban. Um, we have a ban of $787,175 due um, the June 2nd, and um, that's with Greenfield Cooperative Bank. We're paying, um, of that amount, we are completely paying down principal of 317,861, meaning that we are rolling over the 469,000 or so into the new ban. Um, uh, the ban we did bids this morning. Our total ban, since we have 573,000 in new borrowing, our total ban was for 1,042,842. And the lowest ban, again, was Greenfield Cooperative Bank, and that came in at 1.7%. The um, interest rates are higher than we've seen in the past. Uh, the one that we are paying off to Greenfield Community from just a uh, Greenfield Cooperative from just a year ago, for example, is 0.35%, which is amazingly low, but we're still very doing very well at 1.7. Of the six bids, we had three under 2% and um, three over 2%. So uh, we were happy to get, um, to get those bids. Let's see. Um, so yeah, I wanted to point out to you how much we were actually paying out of these bands each year, that this is not just simply a rollover. They just don't come due when we renew them, that we do pay off. <coughs> and that is due to the amount, um, it's, it's in the budget, that's the amount that we're paying from uh, in um, the principal and um, debt and interest, principal and interest uh, part of the budget. So we're trying to get, we pay chunks of our principal off each year so that we have room for borrowing more so it's kind of it's a it's an ongoing system and it works for us very well and allows us to keep an even uh, debt and interest payment schedule from year to year so that is it um those that award went out this afternoon i've been working with david eisenthal on on the paperwork he was getting it done and to come out to us and it should be in town hall tomorrow by fedex so i need we will need at least three of you by the end of Monday to come through. And once I've set up the paperwork to, to sign uh, where indicated, and then um, 
so that I'll be able to upload it to Department of Revenue on Tuesday. And then we will um, do these payoffs and get our new amounts the first week in June. Any questions for Linda? Uh, yeah, I just have a quick question. <clears throat> Linda, when you did the um, put together the budget for the debt and interest, mm -hmm. um, what sort of interest rate were you was used as a presumption throughout the year? I, um, I always um, use a, a higher than anticipated one. I think mm -hmm. I use 3%. Okay. And that way, uh, the amount of principal and interest that we pay through the budget is going to be the same. The total will be the same. But um, paying, if, we have, if we're paying less interest than was anticipated, that means we will be able to pay off more principal. Which is what, which is how we balance those two budgets each year, so that we make sure that our total payment between the two is the same. So that's that's really it. Just as when we were doing the bonds, we were estimating five percent and then four percent, and the bonds ended up coming. Um, actually, one was two point eight percent and one was one point nine five five, and that really benefits us in that we've we've estimated a good payment that we can do, but when it actually comes to making those payments, we end up being able to pay off more of the principal, which means we have less to roll over into the new borrowing in the next year and allows us to, um, to um, uh, put the borrowing towards the newer items that the town has approved. Um, we only, uh, the actual borrowing that the town has approved is higher than these amounts that we are borrowing. I work closely with department heads and make sure that we only borrow what they know they actually need at this time. And if they don't need it by July 1, we put it off and we will borrow it in the next year. And that, uh, that in itself is, is equally effective in keeping our interest rate down because we're uh, applying the interest to a lower principal amount. So we do our best. And you do a wonderful job. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to say that I like your policies, Linda. Very oh, good. Good. All right. I, I would like to get more of this into the budget book. Um, I, I realize that there's a lot of this kind of information that you as select board should probably have. So we're looking into making supplements to the budget book so that you have that kind of information. What are we borrowing? How much is our outstanding principal? The first thing I wanna to do to get into that budget book is uh, what we actually voted at town meeting. Since the budget book is always what's proposed two or three months before town meeting. Now that we've actually voted on it, we should have, um, you know, we will have sections that you can add to your budget books that will show what we voted at town meeting. And then uh, if we make adjustments in the fall, that you'll be able to get that in. And I was thinking to a, a few pages on where we stand with these, uh, with the borrowing and the interest rates and what we're paying on these probably would be useful for you to have as well. So if there's other things that you want to be able to, to have uh, people ask you about, uh, just let me know. And usually I, we can just uh, add a little bit to that and um, um, have you better informed. Thank you. Sounds great. Okay. All right. Moving along, 6.2. Hadley Police Department, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Anybody else get feedback? No. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so tonight I will be recommending uh, three officers. Our uh, special police officer ranks up to fill the vacancies that we have in our full-time ranks. Um, most of you have heard me ad nauseum talk about the problems that we're having with uh, recruitment and retention um, for the edification of uh, Molly and, and Randy. Um, Molly, I'm sure you, you, know, you remember from that when you were on the board in the past, we have these obstacles we have to overcome with wages and things like that to make sure that we can keep officers for, um, you know, for the, the long run. Um, and uh, with the new post requirements and the requirements set forth by the MPTC, we are finally in a position where um, we can fill these vacancies. Over the course of the last several months, we lost, uh, I don't know, probably 20% of our full-time staff to other agencies um, for higher wages. Um, we are in negotiations right now to try to remedy some of that, but uh, uh, on a positive note, I have three amazing individuals to recommend to you tonight for promotion to those ranks. 
So the first is Brianna Yusko. Um, I'm sure many of you know Brianna and her family. She's a graduate of Hopkins Academy. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and psychology from Westfield State. Uh, she's been employed as a full-time dispatcher in Northampton since 2014, and she's actually worked for us in the same capacity since 2018. In June of 2021, she applied to be a special police officer here. Uh, we had already identified several um, quality characteristics that we look for in a candidate, and so the choice was very easy. She made it very easy for us to, uh, to bring her on board. She has been in training since then while also juggling uh, her full-time job uh, and the police academy. Um, and she is actually set to begin the academy in about two and a half weeks uh, on uh, June 6th. So the second candidate is Alex Levine. Uh, Alex also possesses a bachelor's degree in legal studies, which he earned at UMass. He has been working with us uh, as a special police officer since July of 2021 and previously worked as a uh, police officer in Belchertown. Alex has cleared field training and he's actually currently filling shifts to help with our multiple vacancies. And uh, he was just approved, uh, or at least he will be approved very soon for a waiver from MPTC, which will allow him to um, basically be eligible to work as a full-time police officer until the next uh, available police academy. We plan to send him uh, to the academy that uh, likely uh, there'll be a short break after Brianna's academy, and we plan to send him to that next one. And the final recommendation is James Ryan. Uh, James is a, a current Hadley resident, and he also has a, a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Elms College. We hired Jamie um, as a special police officer also in June of 2021, the same as Brianna, and uh, he completed training several months ago. And since then, he's been working uh, really hard to do the same thing that Alex is doing and help us fill uh, shifts and fill these gaps uh, with these vacancies that we have. Uh, we will be requesting a waiver for Jamie at the June MPTC meeting, uh, which is why, as you'll hear in a minute, I'll be recommending different start dates for all of them. Uh, but that will allow him to work on a full-time basis until that next police academy again. All three of these officers meet all post requirements and MPTC requirements for hiring. And so... Uh, <coughs> I would recommend that the motion be that Brianna Yusko be appointed as a full-time police officer with an official start date of June 4th, 2022, that Alex Levine be appointed as a full-time police officer with an official start date of June 11, 2022, and that James Ryan be appointed as a full-time police officer with an official start date of June 25, 2022. I'll make a motion to accept your recommendation. I'll second. second that. Motion by Joyce. I think it was second by Randy. Uh, roll call vote, please, Jennifer. Before I do the roll call vote, if you have more than one device on, in a room that's why you're getting feedback and it's why it keeps happening so if everybody could just make sure you only got one device going um roll call vote nevin smith yes chungalo yes parsons yes Iser. yes and keegan yes thank you thank, thank you all no, welcome brianna thank you for coming on tonight yes appreciate seeing thank you guys friends. <laughs> All right, moving along to 6.3, Chapter 90, Scott McCarthy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just like to give you an update on the Chapter 90 paving. Uh, to begin with, uh, <clears throat> the Chapter 90 was kind of left on our manager of the DPW. So uh, myself and the office staff was able to put that all uh, back in order and get our full reimbursements from MassDOT. 
with that being said, right now we have an availability of $300,000 for paving. Uh, so I'd like to move forward and try to get some paving in before uh, June 30th under this the contract we have right now. The price is going to be uh, a lot cheaper than the next one coming up. Uh, currently, they're only implementing a $5 a ton surcharge on the asphalt. And I'm assuming next year it's going to be a lot higher. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to propose to the board to uh, do some paving on Rocky Hill Road. But there's only one, there's one problem with that. And <clears throat> at the town meeting, there was a concern for infrastructure and water and so on and so forth. With that being said, I just want the board to be aware that there's, there's some severe water uh, main problems on Rocky Hill Road that I guess in a perfect world, you, want, you would want to uh, do some pipeline work first before you pave the road. Uh, and I just, I, I would like you guys to make that decision of what you would like to do uh, and go, go from there. Uh, the pipeline work on Rocky Hill Road basically would start at, down on River Drive and go up to uh, somewhere in Wampanoag, Breckenridge in that area. I'm not exactly sure where the better connection is. Uh, and that's about a mile of worth of pipe work. And uh, it's going to be expensive, without a doubt. Uh, I did a little research from uh, the contractor that uh, bid our Route 9 project. And last fall when he bid that, he bid, or the bid he, he was awarded was $130 a linear foot for installing the pipe and the pipe itself. That does not include any fittings, any fire hydrants, any service connection to houses, any patchwork to the existing road. So, I mean, you're, you're probably talking one and a half, $2 million project. I just, I just feel that the, the road condition, I, I'm, I'm assuming you folks travel Rocky Hill Road, uh, you know what's in pretty poor condition. And I just, I'd like to do something there, but it might not be in our best interest to do so with the current condition of the utilities underneath. What were you repairing there the other day, Scott? Uh, we were just doing some potholes, Joyce. Uh, we got a bunch of complaints in the area just for potholes. We went out, uh, patched some potholes there in uh, North Maple Street. We were just trying to fill potholes. So it should be less traffic going 30 miles an hour on that road, right? Well, <laughs> I guess the rougher it is, the slower people go to Joyce. So Yeah, I know. Uh, but... Uh, well, they had they had asked for speed bumps along that road too because they um, didn't want. We've had problems around Rocky Hill Road for a number of years, and um, the police have been very good about um, trafficking people and um, ticketing them um, coming along Rocky Hill Road. So, um, they've done their part. I don't know if we still want to think about doing. Um, with Route 9 now going under construction, if we want to think about putting a few of those speed bumps along in there for a time being, if that's not too costly, um, just to make sure people are not, because that's going to become a well-traveled road, as well as my street that I live on, Bay Road, and getting out of my driveway in the morning is not really all that great. Um, but that's going to be what's going to happen when Route 9 gets dug up and we're going to see that throughout the town. Yeah. There, there is just a touch on that, Joyce. I know it's kind of off the topic. Uh, the project was supposed to kind of get going now to start putting some utilities in the ground. And there is a delay, of course, on material. So now they're mm -hmm. middle to late June if their parts arrive. So uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, they're just doing some preliminary work still and they're just waiting on okay. materials. 
All right. So what did you think about doing any of the speed bumps on Rocky Hill? At some point you're talking about repaving and things right now, but what about those speed bumps uh, as the Route 9 project goes along? Um, do you think it's feasible for us to do that along that road? Well, if you wanted to resurface the road completely on Rocky Hill Road, I, I'm not a big fan of speed tables or speed bone choice, especially on a section of road like that. It's pretty long, and I, I know mm -hmm. the speed's a problem, but it, it does cause a problem with for us with snow and ice removal, uh, especially on a, a road like that that's not flat. It's hilly and windy, and the, for us to lose our momentum. Yeah. Well, do you think it's do you think it's feasible for us to even think about doing paving on that road when it's going to be so much more traveled within the next year year and a half? Do you think we ought to well, wait on Rocky Hill until after all that traveling is done? Well, that's a double edged sword kind of thing. If we don't pave it, the the constant pounding of the potholes and uneven surfaces when you get water in there or whatever, just, it makes it break apart that much faster. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and yeah, you're right. There is going to be increased load on it. So you kind of would want to wait, but the road's in pretty bad shape. Uh, obviously you saw us out there trying to patch it back together. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I, I guess in the big picture, Joyce, it's, it's that section there that needs some utility work and, Mm -hmm. What you as the board would like to, usually you don't want to pave a road and then come back in a couple of years and do utility work. It's just, you, you kind of want that done prior to road reconstruction. Well, you, you just but, give us the, whatever you think you need and we'll just <laughs> help, help you along with it. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I understand that Joyce, that this is just a big, it's a big ticket item. It, that's your, yeah. your it's $300,000. And part of it, we're paving over an infrastructure that is not well. It's, it's severely undersized, uh, yeah. you know, fire protection, water so our quality, et cetera, et cetera. So our, it, it's our not chapter good. 90 money we got just now was uh, Carolyn of 300 and something thousand dollars, correct? On the on the chapter ninety, for right now we got for the year. Joyce, we have three three hundred thousand right now from left our prior left uh, from reimbursements and stuff that were not processed from the prior management. Uh, okay, myself and the staff were able to get that all together and uh, got our reimbursements back, and we have three hundred thousand dollars. The uh, FY23 is issued uh, July 1, and, and there was, uh, I forget, Carolyn, you could correct me if I'm wrong, it was winter recovery something or other money that the town got for road work. I believe it was around $200,000, but that has not been released yet. Yeah. And then you it, it's, it's coming. Yeah, and but then you still have Chapter ninety money on top of that July first, besides the recovery money. Right, we'll get our we'll get our new uh, installment of whatever the state the state hasn't said yet what they're giving. I thought I thought they did. I have not received anything on that yet. Didn't we get a, some notification, Carolyn, on how much uh, Chapter ninety money that was coming? Or was that just from Dan Carey of what money was going to be allowed from, from the state for Chapter 90? Well, I, it's part of this, you have to see, you, you get notified that there's money available. I want to say it was just under 300000 but you yeah. still have to go through the process of, I've sent the email, they reply back, they're going to give instructions on how to uh, access that money. So Okay. Scott, is this paving on top of or taking down and putting a new base surface? Uh, it, it would be milled, Jane, uh, two inches and then repaved two inches. Uh, we can't overlay the road there, just add more asphalt like we've done in the past. The road is too high. And as you start climbing the hill, we're going to have uh, water poems that are 
the water, the drive, the road is going to be higher than the driveway. So we, we couldn't even do that if we wanted. Uh, so it would be a mill and resurface, but uh, there's other options too. I, I've looked at a couple other roads, but I feel Rocky Hill is the worst, but there's other problems that well, you may or may it, not want to address first. Living in that area, <laughs> it's, it's my recollection that it was already paved like from 47 out to sunrise approximately. Yes, prior prior to my me coming to the town, it was paved from River Drive to East Street, and the prior director paved from East Street to uh, I don't have the address in front of me, but it's where the tobacco barn is there on the if you're going up Rocky Hill Road on the uh, yeah. left. Yeah. yeah, just before the hill, so it's just Rocky yeah. Hill Road. So you would redo that part also, or start there and continue. East. We would start there and continue to uh, the intersection of Huntington Road. Uh, we don't quite have enough funding to get up by the cemetery. Wait. Now, the, the pipes you talk about, those are just water lines, correct? There's no drainage in the road. Uh, very little drainage, uh, Randy. Uh, there is, I believe, one catch basin. Uh, <laughs> across if you're going up rocky hill road it'd be on the left hand yeah. side of, across from uh uh i, I can't even think of uh, the resident's name uh but as you start making a little sweep to the left it's right there uh fighting kevich me yeah fighting kevich residence would be across the street that, in that general area there's that's the only drainage okay if you're familiar with that so, area. So yeah. talking about the infrastructure and the pipes, how would you propose in an ideal world we would get money to do that work here? Uh, I, I, I have <laughs> no idea, Jane. I, I, I guess it would have to be funded through uh, the water department somehow, some way or somehow. Uh, I, I know... Uh, Myself and Carolyn have been looking at every grant option and things available. And a lot of, you know, right now, I don't believe there is any available um, to even apply for. But with that being said, I guess our options are pretty limited for funding. Jane, can I jump in here? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, maybe it, there are a lot of questions, obviously, um, about this. So, I, I mean, I can't. It doesn't make any sense to me that we would expend the paving dollars without dealing with a long-term solution, right? <clears throat> As um, Scott's laid out here, but I don't think we're in a position tonight to really have our heads wrapped around the funding. There's an awful lot of money out there for infrastructure, and we all know that. Um, in between the Forward Act and this, you know, winter recovery, uh, the ARPA dollars. So I'm wondering if it makes sense. Um, that it sounds to me like what Scott's saying is this is his plan A, and that he feels that Rocky Hill Road should, to Joyce's point, you know, her question, um, be repaired in advance of the obviously heavily increasing traffic we're going to see as the Route 9 project gets underway. Um, so if that's his plan A, I think that maybe um, the financial management team should get together and figure out what any funding options there are out there, if there's anything that's feasible to make this project happen for Scott. Um, and if the answer to that is no, or we have to wait um, till fall town meeting and Scott doesn't think that we can wait that long, then we should be prepared to find out what Scott's plan B or C might be relative to expending these dollars. Randy? So if the intent is to tr try to find money to be able to repair the water lines and and that's even if we came up with the funding tomorrow there's no way that the the water lines are going to get replaced and the road is going to get paved before they start working on route nine so i don't know uh, that plan a is necessarily a good idea right now i agree that it makes no sense to spend the money to pave and then have to rip it up to repair the water lines so I think we have to figure out 
how to get the water lines repaired and whatever time frame that takes, uh, we have no choice but to deal with it. I also heard Scott saying that this money needs to be used by the end of this fiscal year. So, Scott, what is plan B? Because it doesn't uh, sound like we can get our... <coughs> yeah, so, so it, it, really, it doesn't necessarily have to be used. It would be, we'd be able to get more bang for our buck, I guess, if we did something now because the price of asphalt is going to skyrocket. So my plan B would request to uh, do some work on... Hockenum Road, uh, starting at Mitch's Way to the South Hadley line. Uh, and right in that section, there is, you know, the water mains, you know, from the 70s, it's it's not on their size. It's, it's mostly off the road. Uh, there's very little drainage out there. It's, uh, that would be my request for plan B. And I do not have uh, the work up on that in front of me to tell you the exact dollar amount. Uh, the paving contractor looked at it, but then we shifted kind of gears to Rocky Hill Road because it was in worse shape. But uh, they told me that they would be able to accommodate us before June 30th to uh, do that. If, if, you, if that's the direction you folks would like to go. Randy? I drive Rocky Hill Road every day and my daughter lives in South Hadley. So I drive to South Hadley quite a bit. And I think I try to dodge more potholes on Hockenham Road than I do on Rocky Hill Road. So I think plan B under the circumstances is a better idea. Jane, Bill Dwyer has his hand up. I don't know if you can I'm see sorry, it. I don't see that, Bill. Oh, I do see it. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I, I want to talk about a plan C, or maybe it's a plan D. Um, Scott and I are Hadley's representatives to the Joint Transportation Committee. Uh, Hadley's participation in that has been uh, spotty in the past. The Joint Transportation Committee is how we access federal funds for road work. And uh, we're really sort of behind the eight ball on this one. Um, we've had some, a couple of projects that dropped off a few years ago because they weren't being pursued by uh, the, car, the, the then representatives. Um, it's not a way to access federal money this year, maybe not even next year, um, but Rocky Hill Road is a road that is eligible for federal funding. And um, so uh, I've been attending the Joint Transportation Committee meetings. Um, it's a busy time for Scott because, uh, oh, lots is happening out on the roads. But uh, I have been able to attend. Um, in the, it's a, a constant shuffling of this project isn't ready to go, but do we have another project that is, requires less than $3 million that we could move in. Um, there's design work that needs to be done uh, in advance. We don't have that in the bank at the moment, but um, there are longer-term solutions out there. Um, we just have to uh, uh, get, get up to speed on getting back in the line. Thank you, Bill. And Bill, I think that underscores the, the point I'm trying to make, which is it, it seems that, you know, Scott has a short term issue, which is we need to do something with this chapter 90 money by the end of the fiscal year. So there's a very tight window, um, but there needs to be a whole street plan that's accompanied with a with a funding plan um, for the long term for dealing with all of the in infrastructure. And I think it would be great to start um, a project like that. Now, you know, working with the DPW, whoever needs to, and, and whoever on finance um, to start figuring that out because of all of the different funding options that are out there currently. And we don't know how much longer those um, programs are gonna be available. So at the moment, Hadley looks like it is in hog heaven because um, we are 
Transportation Improvement Program, the TIP, we are um, being credited with the work the state is doing on Route 9 and the work the state is proposing on the bridges, uh, the bridge on uh, Route 47 South. Um, so it looks like we're flush with uh, federal and state money, but it's not Hadley projects. Mm -hmm. So will that be to our detriment or to our advantage? I I'm gonna ask for a footnote to be put in the transportation improvement plan to say that these are not Hadley town projects. Uh, my understanding is that chapter 90 was uh, sort of a supplement to fill in where uh, projects for work that did not qualify under the transportation improvement program. Um, so in Hadley, and I've done some research on it, their roads are eligible for federal funds and what are not. Uh, River Drive is, South Maple Street is, Rocky Hill Road is. Um, streets off of those are not eligible for federal funding. So that would be something we'd have to fund what at about, the local level. What about Hockenham? Where is uh, I believe it is, uh, although again, I can't say um, how, how far back in the line we are. So from my being on the board all these years and taking road tours um, over multiple years, um, we always went to go around and see actually what roads um, were on the list uh, of what we could use Chapter 90 money for. And that seemed to work pretty well. We, you know, depended on our person as you are, Scott, now. Um, to let us know what roads you wanted to use that Chapter 90 money for, uh, whether it was oiling or stone or paving. Um, but we always went on and we always, you know, took a tour of what we thought um, might be feasible to use that money for. Um, you know, I'm going with your gut. You guys plow the roads. You're the ones that take care of the roads. It's not us, certainly. Well, I go to... <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking for your direction on how you want to spend that Chapter 90 money and what we should do. Yes, our utilities and things are important, and you keep that in consideration. When you do, you know, make your list of things that need to get done, whether stoning, oiling, whatever you want to do with that. You know, and you figure that out on how you want to spend it, and we'll go along with you. Hey, hey, thank, thanks, Joyce, for that. And, and I would suggest that I'm just kind of torn with the whole Rocky Hill Road situation though. Throw yep. a large amount of money at something that we, we probably shouldn't at this point. I know it needs to be done, but I think we should wait on uh, and make a good decision of what our future uh, steps are going to be to uh, do some infrastructure work. So, so re uh, so re look at that and see what you can use that money for before the yeah, end of the I, year. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's for that section, you yeah. know, at least do a section of Rocky Hill Road if you feel that that's what we're going to do and at least do that part of it. And then we can do whatever with the rest of the money. Um, you know how far it goes and it doesn't go very far today. No, that and that's why uh, I'm bringing this to the board's uh, attention. The, uh, you know, I guess remotely, it's not my money. It, it's, uh, you know, the residents of Hadley and I just want a good, you know, educated decision on, on what to do with this and how it's going to benefit everyone the most. And I guess what right now, with that being said, I, I think we should work on hawking them. Well, okay. I, I agree with Randy because I drive both of those roads and they're definitely more potholes and uh, things to avoid going south from town. A lot of our roads need attention. We've been neglecting them for a couple of years now. Um, we've been doing side streets and whatever, but um, the main roads that get traveled the most certainly need to get looked at the most um, and, and go from there. So your decision, we support you. Just give us a okay. list. I, I, I'm going to uh, uh, ask then that you approve that we do hawking them uh, try to get it in this fiscal year, I can uh, start getting going on that.
I'll make a motion for. for, Yes, thank you. Hey, Amy. Amy made the motion. Yay, second. Three seconds. Any other discussion? Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Jane, can I just make a, a follow-up comment, though, to this? Sure, please. Um, I think one of the things that I'm hoping to see that we can improve on, you know, Scott's coming tonight, again, with, with something that's under a deadline, and it seems that there was a lot a lot to discuss here. And I'm hoping that going forward, um, you know, we can try to schedule some of these discussions so that we can talk, take it under advisement, have some follow-up research is needed and then come back, you know, so we're not voting on, on things the very first night that we hear it. Um, And I'm also hoping that as a follow-up, so now that Scott's got the direction to go to Hockenham, that we don't lose sight of the fact that he's identified Rocky Hill Road as an issue and that we should support him by working together to come up with a plan to figure out how he can get that done in the future. But some of the things, but some of the things don't always need to be put off to another meeting. Some of the things that people bring to us can be made at a decision and at a meeting that is brought to us and not put off and take under advisement. If sometimes we can't make a decision when people bring us something, then something is wrong with this picture. Yes, we can take some things under advisement, but when th- we are under a deadline here, those things need to be made now, not later. Well, I think what Molly is saying is that we should uh, try to plan a little further ahead and get a uh, longer range plan. Yes, there are some things that need immediate votes, but there are some things that are major directions for the town that we need to spend a little more time on and perhaps have more research done before we But we had a DPW director that did nothing, and now Scott is picking up the pieces where he left off. So. Let's appreciate Scott immensely for what he has. Absolutely. So let's not badger the guy for bringing this forward to us at a late date when we're at the bottom of the pits here. I don't think that's what what Molly's saying at all. I think Molly, um, we're all in agreement. Let's let's go with it. But both been done. I need to do what he really needs and figure out how we can back DPW to get our infrastructure fixed. Yeah. first. Can I say something, please? I would like to hear from Mr. Dwyer and Scott regarding what it's going to take to keep us in the queue for that federal money they were talking about so that we don't lose out on that. (laughs) You know, we can get money two, three, four years out, then we can start doing this long range planning you were talking about. And that's another discussion for another meeting so that we can have some better direction on uh, what we can do for long-term. We're doing short-term right now with Scott bringing this forward to us and being able to spend the $300,000 before the end of the fiscal year. I get that, Joyce. We already voted on that. No problem with that. But while Bill and here, and Bill seemed to allude to the fact that the ball was dropped previously on this federal money, and I don't want to see that happen again. If we can get the money, then we need to do whatever it takes to get it. That's that's my point. And that would be Scott and Bill working on that together. I, I would appreciate that. Jane, well, I just, Jane is it me. okay if I, it, Jane, is it okay if I just make a few comments? Yes. It might uh, give some, some confidence here. Um, so Scott and I, the reason this came to the table today is after discussions. So Scott and I meet every week at least once to go over all of the projects that um, when I say since I've been here, it's been pretty much what's the next crisis with infrastructure. So what happens is Scott will come to me and say, these, these issues are priority or this, this issue is an emergency. And then what I do is I will go back to the finance team and we do talk about here's the issue. Um, Linda and I have worked closely on several of the projects to see how to fund that. Also, we have grants in the process as well. I, I, I do want to clarify that there's a lot of due diligence that goes before what you just heard from Scott tonight. Um, 
what happened was with this particularly, and also on a comment that was made at top, fixing other things and we're ignoring them. I want you all to know, Scott and I are working on them at least every week. We go through these discussions and try to see what can we accomplish with what money we have and what money we know, anticipate, or also what money we know is not going to come to Hadley. So we have to prioritize weighing all of that. So this was a, an example where Scott came and said, this is, does not make sense to pave this road and here's why. I wanted and Scott wanted to bring it to you to say, this is the type of dilemma that we're getting faced with all the time. Mm -hmm. And that we want you to say, to make sure you're aware of it when people come, if they complain that Rocky Hills is all beat up and it's deteriorating, this is one of the reasons why that's not getting addressed because of other years of neglect that didn't take care of the utilities and all of that. So we are doing some of the things that you guys are mentioning, but we need you guys as the, as the now, um, to do exactly what you just did to say, Scott, you're right. Let's what's the next one on your plate. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. So <clears throat> what uh, my reply to you, Randy, is that uh, Scott and I are working together to uh, first identify the where we were when the project stopped being pursued. Um, uh, Scott gifted me with two fat folders, which I have been going through for a couple of projects that uh, were on the transportation improvement plan and then dropped off. Um, I am also uh, trying to be in contact with the uh, gatekeeper at uh, Mass Highway District 2. There is a process for submitting a project uh, the projects that dropped off were submitted, but um, never had any, uh, it's unclear how much design work was done. So um, I think uh, probably the best thing to do is we, Scott and I will work on trying to figure out what happened, we'll do a post-mortem on uh, the two files and um, then have a discussion about whether those remain priorities or whether uh, there are other priorities that that fall under the transportation improvement plan. Um, basically anything we come up with will be a few years out at this point. Um, but um, but we'll see. We'll see what's out there. Okay, I appreciate that, Bill. Thank you. Just, just on another note for for you guys before we move on. I, I'm assuming that everyone uh, got the next all note. We're going to be, they're going to start prep work tomorrow on Nightly Road and paving on Friday. So that job will be complete. That was uh, uh, presented by, to, <coughs> by the previous director and was approved by Mass DLT, but we didn't do it last year because of the, the head wall problem and that's been fixed. So that, that has all been uh, approved and ready to go. So they're going to be starting that tomorrow. Thank you. That's good. Anything else for Scott? No, thank you, Scott. All thank right. Thank you. 6.4, EPW wastewater promotion and internal job posting. Jen Provoda, are you here? I am here. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, the DPW has been having Peter Clough as the um, interim waste meeting, and we would officially like to make him the full-time wastewater chief operator and officially promote him. Scott, do you have any input on that, please? Yes, uh, Joyce. Uh, in our previous discussions uh, with this, uh, Peter has been uh, doing a really good job with this. He has uh, uh, the state just recently required us to go all electronic with all our documents back to them. He was able to uh, take care of all that for us and everything down there is really working well right now. Uh, Jen did uh, 
do a search for qualified applicants for that position. And we had uh, two applicants apply and they were uh, not qualified for the job. So, uh, and we have not had any more applicants since. And uh, what this would keep the ball rolling for us because uh, one of the guys from the highway department has been filling in over there. And I'm assuming that he would like to apply for Peter's Peter was just an operator and that position would be open and the, the highway department employee I'm assuming would apply for that. And then we could remotely uh, fill our vacancy in the highway department. The highway department has been operating since I believe February with uh, one guy short. So what is Peter's uh, qualifications and what does he need to become permanent um, chief operator? He, he, ha he has all the qualifications. I, I know he has a, de a degree. I'm not sure what it's in. Uh, he wasn't available tonight to come on to the meeting, uh, but mm -hmm. he has the grade four wastewater license. Uh, as we talked about in the past, the state did give him a waiver for site specific in full operator because he's not uh he doesn't have the time yet to get it to go anywhere else so if he were to leave that would be no one void but it's site specific for us mm -hmm. so in the state's eyes he is qualified to do the job and i i would support that i think i think he is doing a really good job over there uh uh keep keeping the uh, operation going uh uh, obviously, you know, he has uh, John there helping him and, you know, Dennis is there answering questions when uh, he's working his shifts. So it, under the circumstances, I think Joyce, he would be our best candidate. I'm, I'm all for it. And how much is Dennis going to be working afterwards until we can get a fill? Uh, he, he's doing part time for up to 12 hours a week. Uh, and he's filling in, it, it's only a, like I said, a three man operation over there. And, uh, you know, it's summertime now and people are taking vacations and, you know, things of that. So Dennis is kind of filling in the gap. So I, I, I would be assuming maybe, you know, labor day or something after the summer goes by, we could talk about that whole situation and readdress it. But, between now and then, I, I would suggest uh, keeping Dennis on. Yeah, it, it, I, it, I, I know some of these answers, but I just wanted this put out there for the public yeah. because they always ask these questions, Scott. Yeah, no, I Thank understand. Uh, but with even Dennis there for the little bit he, ha he is, when everyone is there, the department in whole is able to do a lot more work. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it So... However you look at it, it, it's a benefit for us to have that fourth guy, even though it's only 12 hours a week, but we are yep. able to uh, do some more work there. Yep, to our benefit for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Do you need a motion on this, Jen? So moved. Second. Three seconds. Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call, Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, is there anyone here from the ZBA who's requesting their filing fee to increase? I see Andrew Hi, Bombardier. Great. Andrew? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, this, this is a request to re increase our filing fee from uh, from 150 to 400 dollars. Basically, the the reason for the request is um, because of increased uh, legal notice fees uh, that we're getting from the Gazette. The uh, the most recent meeting we posted, we have to post our meetings um, twice in the paper, once two weeks out, and then once a week out. The most recent one that we did 
uh, for two meetings that, you know, I did the notices as small as I could and uh, it was $486 for the two notices. So um, what we had previously been able to do when the notices were uh, cheaper was, you know, we would batch, you know, one or two um we'd uh, two or three rather uh meetings together and that would you know cover the the filing fee with the gazette but um you know the just the prices have gone up to the extent that it's now um a, a loser for us uh you know that money doesn't come to our we don't have a an account on that it's it goes into the general fund but um it's just something that has come to our attention and uh i've been on the board now for uh, i think about 10 years and we, I don't think it's been increased from 150 in, in that time. You're, you're not old enough to be on that board for 10 years. <laughs> I know. It doesn't <laughs> seem like it. But <laughs> um, are there, Carolyn, are there any state requirements that we have to do special things to increase fees for ZBA? Uh, I'm, not that, I'm not aware of. Great. That makes it easier. So can I ask Andrew a question? Um, does people that come before you, do they have to pay a fee to you, Andrew? Uh, it's just a just a filing fee, yeah. So, so, uh, are, so are we charging more for their filing fee? So that's that's what this request is to increase the filing fee. So then we we're required to pay for the publication. Uh, they they typically pay for they uh, they, they pre-address and uh, pre-stamp the envelopes for the notifications, but we have we have to pay for the to do the legal notice in the Gazette. So do you think four hundred is enough? Um. I, I mean, I, I think, so I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure exactly to be, uh, you know, to be upfront. I'm not sure exactly what happens, uh, how the Gazette like prices that out. I don't know if there's any type of, you know, supply and demand thing on how busy they are when they price it out or if it's a set fee. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just did that. I, I, I did the 400 based on, you know, that it's at 150. I was trying to, um, you know, be, be somewhat reasonable that I think if it goes up from 150 to 400, then that would we would be able to you know have have notices for one hearing at not having a loss with it, um, and then you know but if I'm still able to you know bundle together more than one hearing, I think there would be plenty of wiggle room there. Okay, okay. Want to so, make sure you have enough money. Yeah, I see Andrew. Bill Dwyer has a and Sue has a hand up. Uh, Jane, okay. Bill. The uh, planning board is likewise going to increase our filing fees. We've posted that we, uh, for our next meeting in June. Um, likewise, uh, we cover the cost of publication and <clears throat> that, uh, fees have just skyrocketed. Thank you. So uh, we're looking at three, four hundred dollars for a, a legal ad for a meeting. OK, thank you, Bill. Sue? Yeah, um, I just wanted to chime in. Uh, you know, I have to advertise my tax titles as well. And it's ridiculously expensive now. Um, but on another note, when we did some work to our house in 1989, when we bought it and had to go before the ZBA, it was $150. Mm. So <laughs> I don't think yeah. it, and I, the law says it has to be a reasonable increase. So I think we're all set. Yeah. I'll make a motion to accept the increase for the ZBA. Hang on. Let's have a second, Randy, and then we'll continue the conversation. Okay. Yeah. I'll second. I'll second. Okay. Okay, Amy, seconds. Okay, Randy. So, uh, Andrew, you said you just paid $486 for one file, was that for uh, one hearing or one one hearing or two hearings or two people was, on hearing? It was two. It was two hearings, and it was it was um, so it was two publication dates with the Gazette. The the publication dates were two weeks apart, so it published twice in the Gazette, but it was for two hearings. So, okay. do you, and so do you have any idea what it would cost for one hearing? I, I don't, uh, just because I. I haven't typically filed for one hearing. I, I know, um, you know, this increase seems like it's somewhat recent because in the past um, I've, you know, bundled together sometimes three or four hearings and it's been, you know, in the 250 range. So I got a little bit of sticker shock when I got this most recent one. I, I think they've increased their prices. Yeah, well, I know, I know the planning board's been talking about their outrageous fees for quite some time. So I agree I just want to make sure, as Joyce said, that 400 is enough. And based on what you just told me, I think it probably is. So I have a, a, 
additional different question. When I used to do advertising with the Gazette, they sell a volume. So the more you advertise, the cheaper it gets. Are all of these ads put in under one, under the town of Hadley, or are they put in separately under different groups from Hadley? Sue? Uh, no, the, the Gazette charges municipalities separately for every everything they do. Um, I will say my association um, is looking to file legislation um, to change or uh, to file changing legislation that requires it to be things to be um, advertised in the newspaper um, and meet the qualification by putting it on the website. Whether that happens or not, who knows, but that's something I brought to our legislative committee uh, three years ago. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Andrew? No, no nothing else for me. Thank you. Okay. All right, we have a motion in a second. Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan. Yes. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. You're welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Jennifer, you want to talk about the transfer station contract extension? Absolutely. Um, we uh, went out to bid last year for the transfer station and we went with Solid Way Solutions, who is, <clears throat> excuse me, been our uh, transfer station operator for, I think, probably two decades almost at this point. Um, and we did go with them again. They had the best and only offer. <laughs> um, and we did include in the contract two one-year extensions. I would like to ask the select board to extend the contract uh, for this upcoming year, this upcoming fiscal year. Um, there are no changes to the price. There are no changes to the services other than and the textiles and mattresses recycling that were presented to y'all by Kathy Nelson at the last meeting. But other than that, everything else is staying the same. So I would ask that y'all approve extending the contract for another year. So, how do so moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalu? Yes. Keegan? I'm sorry, hold on, don't do it. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. Sorry, I like to keep you in order. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Easy Rider Class 2 Auto Dealers License Update. Can I take that one too, please? Sure, thank you. Um, they were not able to get a copy of the plans to the fire department and building inspector as they had been asked to. We received them today. Uh, neither Tommy or Mike had the ability to review those uh, plans in a timely manner. So we're asking to postpone this item until June 1st. No problem. Thank you. All right. And accounting update for fiscal year 23. Carolyn, you get that one. Okay. So to bring other um, either new members or uh, members who are new in the past couple of years, uh, the town of Hadley outsources for our accounting services. So I want to give you what I'm going to be presenting tonight is that our contract with them will be up in July. And I just want to give you the progression of that contract the past couple of years and a possible um, looking at two different options um, to pursue. So I, I wanna give you a little bit of history. Most of you on the board probably know this, but for the public, um, I'm gonna go as far back as when Gail Weiss um, started as an accountant in 2006. She worked about 35 hours a week. Um, she left in 2015. And the, at that point, the town decided to, and I may, I, I wrote notes from other department heads. So if I need clarification from anybody who's listening, um, feel free to butt in. But um, so she left in 2015 and the, decide, and the town decided to outsource for accounting services and chose Bay State Accounting. I won't go into details about that, but that was not a good fit. And the town then contracted out with Kinshire Accounting Services, 
Uh, they also left after a few months. So at that point in 2020, um, the town signed a contract with Melanson um, and that contract was for 58,000. Uh, later on in May of, two, 20, of 2021, the contract was amended for the next fiscal year for $60,000. Um, in September of 21, we ended up hiring an independent contractor who had simultaneously been working with us 10 hours um, a week. So when they um, a change, they submitted a change order to adjust for that, uh, bringing Mary on, and that added $24,000 to the contract. So at that point, this brought the total amount for accounting services to 84,000 for the remainder of that year. So it was pretty much at 87,000. So we've received initial proposal for FY23. We're allowed to extend that accounting contract for another year. Um, we see, received an initial proposal for, uh, for FY23 in the amount of $93,000. So I, I, I thought it was important to share that to, with the select board with that in, increase. And, and I did reach out to Melanson um, and right away just to share my concern over that amount. And I wanted to tell you that they did go down, they did agree to go to lower it to 90,000. So I've, my history, I've only worked with in-house accountants through my municipal, municipal career. Um, and I, I will tell you, Melanson's been very responsive and any complaints I've received have been smaller issues that you might even find with an in-house accountant. So nothing major, nothing significant. However, I do think there are advantages with having an in-house accountant. Um, and I, you know, just even to, if there's an issue, you can go across the hall or if they were downstairs or whatever, you could go and, and talk about that one-on-one. -on -one. I do think there is value to having that uh, an accountant in-house. Um, and so I just did a little bit of research on that. I've been kind of watching um, what's happening across the state and accountants are beginning to uh, resign we have this great resignation happening among municipal employees. Um, it is very difficult to find um, a talented municipal experienced accountant. However, there are some that have been retiring and I've been kind of following what they're doing and they're actually cutting their hours and going to other towns who only need them for you know, 25, 30 hours. Um, I, I think you could hire an accountant, um, in-house accountant for about 35 hours a week with that $90,000, that would not be their salary, their, that would be their salary plus the benefits. Um, so I just, I wanted to just share that um, information with you. I, I wanna tell you what, what I would, what I've been thinking about and I would like the select board to, to uh, kind of weigh in on this. I did talk with Melanson. I asked, I, I've talked with them a lot and they have been very accommodating and that, you know, I told them we were, I was considering presenting this to the select board as a possibility, as, as an option to have an in-house accountant. July 1st is not a good time to make a transition. If this perfect candidate, if we posted in this perfect candidate that had years of municipal experience and understood our software program, we found this jewel. Even so, July 1st is not a good time closing the books and then getting ready throughout the summer to get the free cash certified, not a good time. So I, I went back and forth and talked with uh, Tanya Campbell for a while today about that. They were very accommodating. They've gone through it with other communities. Um, this is an option I'd like to throw out to see if you would be interested if we knew that we had the option to extend the contract with Melanson. I do wanna put a, I, I, I guess I need to say this. I. I would not be interested in doing an RFP for accounting services. I, I do think Melanson is one of the best firms out there. And, and there's not a lot. Um, I, I do like working with them. So I, I would like to consider knowing that we have the option to extend that contract for another year to also see if they could help if there was a transition to consider allowing me and Jen and HR to post for a 35 hour position and to see what who replies? I, I will be honest with you. I think it will be a challenge, but I feel like as the, you know, the, the financial, you know, overseer of, of everything that I need to provide that information to you that you're, it's $90,000 outsourcing. Um, 
you may be able to have, there may be that jewel out there that you could have an in-house and, and um, there are benefits to having an in-house employee. Um, would you be, would that be an option that you would want me to consider is posting for a 35 hour position for an in-house employee? If that person came in and obviously the finance team and anybody else would be a part of that interview process and screening. And if it was agreed that there's nobody, nobody's going to come through this time that we just say, okay, we did our due diligence and we'll continue and extend the contract from Melanson. Does that make sense? Yes. Ask, ask how, many, questions. how many hours do you think we get from Melanson a week? I don't think we're getting 40. I, and I, and I asked that question. We're not getting, we're not getting 40, 35 or 40. I can tell you, I, I have to say, cause I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that you're, I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. Um, if I, if I call Lanson and I ask for a report, if I ask for something within 45 minutes, I have an answer. So I, I just want to be clear about that. Yeah, I think Carolyn really, um, I think she, package the issue nicely. Um, and I will tell you from a nonprofit sector, um, public accounting, accountants are really, really hard to come by these days. So it's not just a municipal accounting issue, but municipal um, staffing's more similar to nonprofit staffing. It, it, it's not always top dollar, right? Um, and so a lot of the people who are going into the field tend to go more towards a corporate um, route where the jobs may be a little bit more high paying, the benefits may be a little bit more robust. So, Carolyn, I think you're right. I think it'll be a, a, an incredible challenge to find the right person for the job, but it doesn't mean that we have to, you know, it, what it sounds like what you're asking for is you just want to run kind of a, a bifurcated path and see which one is going to work out best for the town. So I'm all for that. Any other discussion, comments? Uh, is there any risk of doing, of losing the accountant we have now with this scenario that you're talking about, Carolyn? With Melanson, no. They, they've been very accommodating, very accommodating. Okay, okay. good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Someone want to make a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Molly seconds. All right, Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. You, what? Sorry, no, you're good. Okay, roll call vote. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Iser. Yes. Keegan. Yes. Thank you. All right, moving on to old business. 7.1, Russell School Committee appointment. Carolyn, do you want to speak to this? Um, my recommendation would be to continue posting um, and looking for interest, and I will do work on a press release. We only have one person who has shown an interest in this committee, um, so I think we just got to uh, boost up that uh, the, the press release for that and just see if anybody's interested. So that would be my recommendation. We were going to we were trying to make the appointments today, but you, you, don't, you only have one person. So we would hold off on making that appointment. You might want to change it to the demolition derby. <laughs> I'm I don't think I need a for that. <laughs> I got rid of North Hadley Hall. It's time to now get rid of Russell School. I got a pathway for two years. <laughs> How um, many members do we need on the committee? Carolyn, how many members would we need? What did we agree on, Jennifer? What did they agree on? I don't remember. It was five or seven. I wanted to say it was seven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We did. I was on the, I am on the municipal building committee for the time being. And it was seven that we thought was a good number. And I, I think um, I'm going to have to go back. I, I thought I was copied on an email that got sent I could be imagining this, but I, I'm pretty sure there was somebody else that had expressed an interest in this committee. So I'm going to go back. It would have been in like the last month or so. Um, and I don't think it was Courtney, the person who's on the um, yeah. agenda tonight. 
or if that, they, yeah. If they didn't email me, Molly, they didn't express interest because that was the direction was that it comes through this office so that it's not confusing for people. So if you know who it is, just direct them this way and we'll get them on the list. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if it's an email that you didn't get, Jennifer. So I, I will. I'll go back and uh, try to remember. That was the one thing that we did not do tonight. And probably will, Jane, you would want to put that on the list for the next meeting is uh, responsibilities for um, departments. I actually, Joyce, have a whole list under new business I want to bring up about that. So, yes. Okay. Thank okay, you. thank you. All right. So, all right. So you're going to do that, Carolyn, put out another request. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, streetlight funding update. Okay, so I'm gonna be throwing a lot of numbers out here in a lot of terms. Um, let's see how I do. Um, so just to bring new members up to date, um, we, are, we have been in the middle of uh, purchasing um, lights and fixtures uh, from Eversource. We've been working with a company called Real Term Energy to do the audits and the GIS audits and the research and to help facilitate this. So we are at that point now um, where we have some upcoming expenses that we will be facing. Um, and I have a recommendation at the end on how to pay for that, but I wanna bring everybody up to date. So Eversource um, had a subsidy incentive uh, that was ending December 31st. So we moved along pretty quickly during the, the end of the summer and, the, and during the fall uh, to pursue this. Uh, their subsidy is um, the person. So we've, we've purchased the lights um, and the fixtures. Um, we have some invoices from Real Term Energy for the cost of doing all of that auditing. They, they literally counted and did a whole GIS research on all of the lights. Um, and that, that amount is $13,759.22. That is not that, those are invoices that we have that have not been paid. The estimated cost of purchasing the fixtures, which we haven't done yet, is $45,000. The estimated subsidy from Eversource is $37,000. So the, the issue is you still have to come up with the $45,000 um, and then we would get the subsidy back for that. So we have to come up with, with, with that upfront money. Um, although the net saving is, it's going to be a roughly $10,000. Uh, we still need to come up with the upfront cash of $45,000. When that subsidy comes back, it's going to go to free cash. Um, so what I want to do is tell you where we're at with ARPA, because that will be the recommendation that I would like to make that we would use ARPA money to do that upfront cost and as well as pay for the GIS audit. Um, we were allocated just so everybody knows a little over 1.5 million. Right now, um, we for the FY22, we used just under 580,000 to um, with lost revenue to balance the budget. Uh, in FY23, we used roughly $400,000 to balance the budget. We have about $140,000 that previously was allocated for the DPW trailers, and we are moving forward that bidding, we're actually gonna finish this weekend, I mean, this, this week. Um, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I asked that you would allocate $300,000 for some se se severe culvert repairs, which Scott and I greatly appreciate. That comes to roughly 1.4. I'm doing rough numbers right now. Um, this leaves enough money to fund the GIS audit and the, the purchase of the fixtures. So my recommendation and request is to pay the remaining costs for the GIS audit provided by real term and the anticipated costs of approximately 45 to 50 for the purchase of the fixtures. So that would be 50,000 50, uh, plus the 13,759 um, that would be about $63,000. Um, so that would be my request that you would approve to allocate that up to, up to $63,000 for the purchase and the payment of that, of the services provided by real time. Does purchase yeah. include installation? So, I'm sorry, what did you say? They're already installed? Yes. Okay. Yep. 
And money taken from ARPA. ARPA. Okay. Motion Carolyn, to approve. I'm sorry, Carolyn. What? Um, so I was just following the 1.5 million and all of the set asides or already used or set asides of the ARPA. So if we do the 63, what's left of the ARPA? Yeah, I, Linda and I were working on those numbers. Linda, what did we say about 100? She went to bed. Oh. She's there. She's just getting. I see her. <laughs> I just have to warm up again. 100 for what? I, I just. What was left over after remember we were doing all that breakdown? Yeah. It was about 100, right? Yes. Uh, yes, just about 100. And we thought rather than allocate that, if anything that you've already talked about goes over, we kind of need that buffer in there because um, we've always estimated about one and a half million up. Yes, and but it's more like one five eight, I think. So we've just yep. got we got some extra cushion in there. But I think Thank we need you. to keep that. We need to keep that cushion until these things have actually been expended. So and there will, there you, will to, yeah. Sorry, Linda. So, there's a so, so, Sorry, go ahead. So I was just asking Linda. So the sixty three thousand is that feasible? Uh, that's included in the um, in what brings us to the. Hundred thousand. Yes. That, yes. Yes. That's already okay. that's included before we get to that point. Yes. Okay. We, we did okay. figure that in as part of the part of the grouping. Okay. And then the ongoing savings you're saying is ten thousand dollars, but that's nope. per year. No, nope. it'll be more than that. It's um, it is ten thousand is a one time. That subsidy that is only going to cover uh, the cost is forty five to fifty. The subsidy is thirty seven. So the ten thousand is not a savings. That's, that's what we're going to, that's the end. That'll be the net. Did I say savings? I did, didn't I? I meant the, so, the net yeah, cost. Yeah, so the rebate, that's what's the cost. Yeah, cost. the net that's cost is going to be yeah. about 10000 right. The ongoing. Okay. They're giving start. us back after wait, we wait, pay. Wait. One at a time. We're in full. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we're still, ultimately, this will cost us $10,000 for the purchase price. Right. And, and then what's okay. the ongoing savings, Carolyn? There, there are ongoing savings, and I'm kicking myself because it's somewhere on this desk. It was, a, it's a significant savings ongoing, and this is something I'm pretty sure that, that the select board um, has been looking at for a few years. This has been like a, a priority to do. So, and I can definitely get that for you, Molly. I, I just thought of it. I didn't have that number for you. That's fine. So basically, we're using ARPA money, and it will ultimately go into free cash. Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct. Um, thirty-seven thousand dollars will go into end up uh, roughly that the subsidy itself. When we get it back, will go into free cash. Okay. All right, I have a motion on the floor from Joyce. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Molly, second. All right. Uh, Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. All right. Town Administrator's Report. Okay. So um, Scott did mention to you about the paving on nightly for Thursday and Friday. I hope that you're all keeping up with the Mass DOT updates every week on what's being impacted um, with Route 9. And I do, I do have to uh, show some appreciation to um, Baltasar for listening to Tony Morales called them during graduation to say, make sure you don't do this work on Friday. And they didn't do it. So that, I, I appreciated that. Uh, and, and so um, it's also on the website. We're updating it on the website as well. And as you see, I, I send that out to um, Lynn at the mall. And so we're keeping everybody updated as best we can. Um, I do want to let you know that Hadley Housing Authority um, does have a vacancy. It actually has two vacancies. One is, net, is immediate. Uh, the other one is the governor appointment um, that will be opening up at the end of May. And I'll, I'll be looking into that on the logistics on how that happens uh, for that governor. Because as you know, one member is appointed by the governor. Um, and just to let you know, we, <laughs> Jennifer and I are working on multiple, multiple RFPs. So that's, we, that is what we are working on. Um, the RFP for legal services is going out, it went out today, 
And I did separate that RFP. I, I, I'm curious to see, I'm doing general counsel and then I'm doing a separate RFP for labor. Um, I, I wanna see what we get back. And as well as IT services, Jennifer has been working really intently on that um, RFP. But this is two of, I wanna say 11 or 12, Jennifer, at least of our RFPs that have to go out like within the next week or two. So um, if you need us to do anything, say, I know you're busy, but in two weeks, can you do this? <laughs> so it's been, there's a lot going on this, this for some reason this year, we, we've just got so many that we're doing. So that's, that's all that I have for you. Thank you. Other you know, items I applaud you for separating the, uh, the, there's a great idea to separate labor in general. Thank you. Other items not anticipated 48 hours in advance. I would like to put on next meeting's agenda more things to do with the um, reorganization, as Joyce pointed out, the liaisons. And I would like to um, actually talk about the role of the liaisons and uh, all of that when we're doing this. There are a great number of committees that the select board has appointed. And I think that though it's really critical we have liaisons to those committees as well as to the other town um, departments and boards. So I'm going to put together a list and ask Jennifer to send it to all of you and have you look at it. And then before the next meeting, circle the top four things you would be interested in and hopefully people won't all overlap and we'll be able to cover these committees. In addition, um, other things um, is a discussion of multiple ways to make town information more available to the residents. Um, question about whether public comment period should only be before the meeting or whether during an actual discussion of an agenda item after the select board has finished discussing it, if we should allow town to discuss it. And I'm sure some of you have things that you would like to see us discuss also about the, the role of the select board. Let's start with Joyce, anything you wanna add on to this? No, but it, it sounds like it's very cumbersome. Um, about we we know what our boards are we know what our committees are that entails uh the liaisons on what we um uh, we have with our departments um you know i'm not you know we have a lot of other committees that people have cropped up and wanted people to participate in and it's very difficult for us to pinpoint select board members to be at every committee meeting. So take that under consideration when you're uh, looking at these committees and things of that nature. We don't have to be present on every committee that's out there. I agree. Um, we, don't, we don't have to be present, but we should be the contact point between the committee and the select board should they have a question. We, we can be a contact person, but we don't need to be, go to every meeting. I agree with that, totally. Yeah, that's fine. Amy? Anything, that or anything else you're interested in talking about how this No, I, I agree with Joyce. Like I'm the liaison for the park and rec and I've only been to, I think two meetings and I'm just here for them when they, they need something. So there are a lot of committees and a, especially quite a few new ones in the past year. But I mean, it is definitely our job to support them. Uh, but right. we also have. Go ahead. Uh, but we also have a job as a select board to govern the town too. So that's about it really. Exactly. It's just that there are so many new committees, we need to make sure we're splitting that sort of responsibility amongst us. And now that we have new members coming in, we need to reassess who's where. And certainly I know that Joyce, your public safety, that's, you know, that's a given. And 
Amy, your partner and Rex, but there are other areas where we also need you to be known as the person if these places have problems. Right, problem. absolutely. I think last year was really just me getting my feet wet, which is, you know, kind of learning about the board and it being my first time on it. So, I mean, that's why this year um, I'm extremely interested in DBW. All right. Well, so what I'm saying is I'm going to send a list of all the, all the boards that I can think of, and maybe there are others I've forgotten and you should add to it and list the ones you would be most interested in. And then and at, um, I'm also on the municipal building committee also, Jane. Well, you, so you can do that when we send this list around. And then if you send it back, yep. me, I'll sort of sort it out and see how it settles. Okay. That's fine. Um, Randy, anything you would like to see us do? Well, you hit on the two th big things I was concerned about. And then to uh, Amy and Joyce's points, I think if we get appointed to a, uh, as a liaison to a certain committee that doesn't meet all that often, as long as we just go at least once, introduce ourselves, tell them what we're there for and give them contact information, I think that would be helpful. And then that'll keep us from having to go to meetings every night of the week. Agreed. Molly, anything you want to add to what we're going to discuss in our no, no, I think you hit um, I think you hit the highlights, you know. So Randy and I obviously are are new, so figuring out what our responsibilities are and if things need to be carved up. Um, Jane, I know you've got an awful lot on your plate, you know. So I'm certainly open minded to um, you know plugging in wherever I can help. Um, and it'll be great to see all of the committees and subcommittees listed because they're. Um, you know, like the housing production plan committee is a subcommittee and it only is going to exist for a certain amount of time. And I'm already on that. So that's, that's easy, but right. um, it'll be, it'd be nice to see the inventory because I, I have no idea right now <laughs> how many committees there are. So. All right. So we'll put that on the next agenda. Anything else people would like to see specifically on the next agenda? All right. Uh, Announcements. Joyce, do you have anything for us? Oh, I guess I do. We we've had a couple of weeks without a few things. So um I don't know how I acquired this job, but anyway, um I do appreciate that the select board does take the time to send out condolences to our families in town that have lost um their loved ones. So I, I guess I'll continue that because that's been a long time thing that I've been doing. So of, of recent, we have uh, Dwight Durrell who has uh, lived in town. He's 83 years old and he has been um, a member of our town for a number of years. So I send out our condolences. He does have a wife in town of Donna Durrell and uh, send out condolences to her also. Uh, Kenneth O'Brien um, passed away earlier this month, um, and he was 94 years old, so he was one of our older constituents, and um, sending our special um, uh, regards to his family and condolences also. Chris Boucher was 59 years old, um, and so I'd like to send out our condolences to her family also. Joan Wines at Crow. Um, Joan, uh, I have known Joan. I had known Joan for a number of years. I was in Mother's Club with her, um, and so sorry to hear of her passing. Um, she was very active in town. She didn't drive. She was. Uh, her sons were very much involved. They were part of the original Hopkins Academy wrestling team that um, participated with Amherst, and um, Joan was. Uh, forever there participating in their um, activities and mother's club. And so certainly are sending our condolences to her family. Edith Matusko, um, 95 years old, um, passed away recently. And we certainly send out our condolences to her and her family um, that live here in town also. John Yusko passed away. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but John uh, Jack uh, was very well known around town 
uh, from the Young Men's Club and taking care of their properties and janitor at the school and ever present at every uh, function that the town had actually and uh, was there on the days of elections and things of that sort. So certainly sending our condolences to his family. Uh, Louise Lesko, 90 years old, um, passed away this past end of April. So certainly sending our condolences to her family. Nancy Waisaki um, passed away this past uh, April also. Um, sending our condolences to her and her family. Margaret Kostovkit, um, sending our condolences to her and her family. Um, I'm not too sure who Margaret was, but uh, let's see, Margaret. Hagen, um, they used to come to the senior center. Did she? Yeah. Yeah, so she certainly. She in the Amherst schools. Oh, yes, she did. It's a Hadley resident. Yes, she was. I, you know, these are all Hadley residents. So just sending our condolences to her and her family also. And I think I did mention, um, I think where I left off was Michael DeCola uh, and his passing away. So condolences to Michael and his family. And that's all I have for this evening. That if seems anybody, like a lot. <laughs> that, that is a lot for sure. But thank you, know, you for keeping track of that, Joyce. I think it's really important. Thank you. Um, other announcements? Remind how about the how about the Memorial Day parade? I was going to do that, but you can do it. Well, you can certainly do it. It's going to be Sunday, and if you have a more itinerary in front of you, Jane, go for it. I don't have well. Certainly, all the cemeteries will be visited early, and the actual parade lineup is at one o'clock at the senior center and two o'clock the parade starts and we'll go through the legion lot down route nine to the west street common and then to the cemetery on cemetery road um, if you're interested you should contact denise barstow who is overseeing the parade if you want to put a float or anything in it you want to be in the lineup and i think that we if we're you're participating in going to the cemeteries. We need to be at the Legion by 1030, quarter of 11. I will send that information out to the select board. Hopefully we can all represent the town. Um, another announcement is on Friday, the last Friday of this month, which is um, June 24th, we will be presenting the Hadley Golden Cane to our oldest resident, who is Stanley Phil. And that will be two o'clock at the Senior Center and all of you are welcome to come. Sorry, Jane, uh, when June is that? June or May. Again? Pardon? June or May. I'm sorry, uh, May. I looked at June, sorry. May uh, 27th. Thank you, Andy. May 27th at what time? Two o'clock at the Senior Center. Two. Okay. We're combining it with our monthly ice cream birthday event so that we'll have a crowd. Sounds good. And there'll be music. Is he and um, Mrs. By the same age? He's several months older. Oh, <laughs> they're neck and neck. <laughs> they are neck and neck. <clears throat> okay, Anything motion to else? adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Joyce. Second. Second by Randy. Jennifer. Roll call vote. Evanston. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Iser. Yes. And Keegan. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Good night. See you. Good night.